Well, hello once again, ladies and gentlemen. Now, last night I went out and saw Hardcore Henry. Now, as far as I know, this isn't uh, a super wide release, so there's a lot of areas that aren't getting this movie, unfortunately, because it is at least different and it is a hard R movie. Luckily, I'm in an area where they we get these films all the time. The more limited releases you'll you'll get in Jersey. One of the one of the one of the benefits of being out here. Disbenefit is the taxes, but enough of that. Uh, so hardcore Henry. Before I get into any spoilers or anything, I guess we'll get to my overall impression. And it's. Mick, I, I I liked it. It, it you've but I gotta add the caveat. It's not gonna be for everybody. Um, it is a how should I put this? It is directed by uh, Ilya Nashul, Nashuler. I think that's how you pronounce his name. He's a Russian director. I don't think he's had any other major Western. Um, well, he did write. Apparently, he wrote for. Uh, Payday 2, or is writing for Payday 2, because I don't think that's out yet. I know Payday 2 is out. But this is his, I want to say, directorial debut. Uh, But it definitely, the movie feels uh, European. I think that's the best way I can put it. It, it, I mean, it it definitely feels European. Uh, Now, part of that might be it's, you know, it's it's a lower-budget film. But if... For people who have seen the film and know a lot of films and have seen other stuff out of Europe, they probably are going, oh yeah, I totally get what you're saying. If if not, it, it's a certain feel uh, that films, a lot of films out of Europe, especially Eastern Europe, have. It, I can't articulate it, but it is def- definitely has a definitely clear European film, made by a European, originally written by a European, uh, and then revised, apparently, later on. I'll get into... To, kind of the background on this in a bit, but it has that vibe to it. It's a very gory film. Uh, Some people have been complaining about motion sickness to the point that they've actually, when I went last night and got the tickets, they had a little sign up there saying, if you're seeing Hardcore Henry, be aware that this uses GoPro. Can go and do a shot GoPro style or something along those lines. It can cause motion sickness. It's a first-person experience. So, yeah. All of that stuff. On the other hand, all that stuff makes you... Some people want to see this movie. Uh, It really is... Obviously, this is probably the best video game movie I've seen out there. Because this really is taking inspiration from... uh, Especially the cutscenes, quote-unquote cutscenes, from Call of Duty and all those. It's taking those and throwing them into a... Making a full movie out of that. It, which is different, because this would be... Well, actually, no. This this is a film, for at least for me, this would be something I would watch on my own. Uh, or This would be something I would already be kind of this cool and interested in. Ooh, there's a cyborg guy running around Moscow fighting a telekinetic mobster? Slash mad scientist? Uh, it... It's this is kind of up my alley already. I mean, we are talking about the guy that I look over here, and I own Ninja Assassins on DVD. So yeah, I would see this movie if it wasn't shot in first person. Um, the first person perspective on the film. I mean, it makes some stuff very interesting. It's gonna make some people completely lose track of what's going on because some of the more intricate action you, uh, you can, if you're Fast with your processing. You know, if you play a lot of video games, you'll probably figure out what the people what people are doing. But because it's basically shot with a GoPro attached to some guy's head, um, certain actions you have to actually figure out what's occurring. Uh, you kind of have to project in your mind. Okay, well he must be looking in this direction, and if he's moving here, okay, obviously somebody must be dragging him by his feet or throwing him up and down like a you do to the, one of those old wrestling dolls, uh, and there, you know, other certain actions where you you have to kind of take the context clues. Okay, he must be stabbing this guy because I hear the actions. I can only see his one arm pulling him in. So there, there is a little bit of that, and for some people, they're not going to like that. I guarantee you. 
uh, other people, like I said, this is, when I said video game movie, it's like you kind of need to play video games because then you'll, I guess, have the experience of knowing this type of narrative. Speaking of narrative, it's very thin on the narrative, too. If you're coming here looking for story, uh, not a whole lot. It's really going from set piece to set piece to set piece to set piece. And I'm okay with that because they go so balls to the wall insane. And, uh, and Charlotte Coplay, who's essentially the main... He's the star of the film, only because we never see Henry. We don't see Henry emote or anything. We don't hear Henry speak. It's very much like watching a video game. So it's really Charlotte Coplay... Uh, I can't pronounce... I can pronounce his name, but I just can't do it right now. Uh, Charlotte Coplay... Whatever, fuck. Uh, his name... His... His characters, he dies a lot in this film. In fact, that can be, that should be the actual, like, subtitle or the the tagline of the film. Charlotte Copley is going to die a lot. And you will see him die in, in many different manners in this film. From being uh, burned to death, shot several ways... Jumping off a roof with grenades strapped to himself to blow up people below. <laughs> um, shot again. Shot again. I think shot again. Uh, and you will see also a naked before mutant baby version of Charlotte Copley. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get into all that in just a little bit. It's kind of spoilery, but he—he's a character. He, he definitely. He, I guess that's how they sold this film to him, is that you'll get to perform all these like different ass character aspects, and you're like the same character, but you're different characters, and they probably sold it to him uh, with that in mind. Uh, it's kind of interesting. It, it, actually, this is—I I, kind of just this came to me, but when I talk about the video game. Uh, comparison to this new film and I kind of mentioned you know Charlotte Copley is really the star of the film because we don't see much of Henry that's kind of like how it is in a lot of games especially you think about like Call of Duty where there's technically you have your main end main protagonist is not actually the character everyone follows and and gets behind like uh, the Modern Warfare series had a uh, price price was really the main character of the story even though you're playing a different character uh but because you're playing him a different character and he's mostly me, you're not seeing reactions and other cool stuff being done because you know, they can't... It, just because of, it's harder to see stuff from your first-person perspective, there's this, like, I guess a new class of character. Somebody will have to come up with it. I'm sure there's an English major somewhere th writing a thesis on us as we speak. Thesis. I can't speak today. Uh, but where it's a character who's actually the the audience's the character the audience is really attached to and following and more concerned with, and the main character is just kind of following him around. It's a weird it's a weird little circumstance, but they they kind of take that too. They've I guess learned from the they've learned from games you know how to do that. It, that's why I keep on saying it's this is actually probably the best video game movie out there because it's like they really took those cut scenes made a live-action film out of it. I'm fairly certain uh, that was the inspiration behind this. Uh, like it, But I said, story extremely thin, and because that thinness, whatever little plot details are dropped in there, along with the, kind of the unusual, the over-the-top stuff, and like I said, the kind of European weirdness. I said, and now again, if you're from Europe, you're probably going, what the fuck are you talking about? You Americans are the weird ones, but there's that weird. Even though they are both first world countries, and we have a shared cultural heritage there, it, they, you get some differences. There's some you can just tell sometimes that a, a movie is made in a certain country or a certain region of the world outside of the race of the actors. Because same thing with Japanese. Even if you do a Japanese movie with white actors. You can kind of tell it's a Japanese movie. Same thing here. Um, I, so it's it's very... I, 
I liked it. I liked it for what it was doing, for for being this kind of hardcore thing. I mean, this apparently this started off as just like a YouTube video. They were they got the concept for the movie. They I forget if it was a Patreon or what it was that they had set up, and it got a lot of buzz, and they decided to commit to making the full movie. But uh, it's I I liked it, but I can de- I guess that's the best way of putting it. I liked it for what it was. It's a stupid action movie. When it when it boils down to it, it's a stupid over the over the top. I'm gonna have to get into some of the just batshit shit that is in this movie. Uh, I, I somebody gets decapitated with an eye socket. You heard me correct. I didn't stutter. That wasn't a mess up this time. Somebody in this film is decapitated, I guess technically by the optical cord nerve, whatever that thing is. Somebody gets decapitated with that. Right now you're going, if you haven't seen the film, you're going, how How does that, how do you do that? But yeah, yeah, people, uh, people have body parts ripped out of them. A lot of shanking... Uh, a lot of heads blown off. Um, weird mutant Charlotte Coplay baby thing. Out of everything in the movie, that's the thing that freaked me out the most. But, yeah, so there's that. So that's the overall impression. There's my impression. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start transitioning into spoiler territory a bit, although, well, not quite, because I'm going to get into the... I mentioned the whole Patreon thing, and this is, this will give me a good excuse to talk about the uh, the company behind this, or the, behind the release of this film, STX, which I forget what I was... I think it was... was I think it was just on a regular news site when I saw this article about STX back before they had their first major release. Um... STX is a new studio that is essentially all basically backed by Chinese money. But they're they're a Hollywood studio. They're they're kind of a Hollywood. Uh, I forget the guy's name, but it, it's a former studio head from another studio who was kind of just wanted to break away from the other companies, get into doing. Their whole big goal is to do kind of medium budget films, which have kind of faded away completely. You have your your lower end budget films like that are run between up to about ten million dollars, sometimes twenty. A lot of times they're called independent films, but for nowadays those are really low budget films. And then you've got your hundred million dollar films, your two hundred million dollar films, and there's nothing in that gap between the two really it used to be there were there there even into the early 2000s there was that you'd still have a 20 uh, 30 million dollar 40 million dollar 50 million dollar films produced and being released um the resident evil series is a good example of that that started as one of those medium budget films actually on the lower end of the medium budget films and they kind of stuck with uh, the 50 to 60 million dollar range for most of them and past two releases, I think, have been you know more around the hundred million dollar range, but still. But that's really faded out. There's a uh, podcast series, uh, Twelve Oh One Beyond, or Twelve Oh One. I forget. I forget. Oh no, wait. Well, that's the website, Twelve Oh One. Dot com or Twelve Oh One Beyond. Dot com, and it's Radio Jerome, which actually started off as Brad Jones' the Cinema Snobs podcast. He kind of eventually dropped out, and he, his co-host kind of took over this sh- completely and moved it to his website. And they did a whole uh, episode on kind of how the medium spectrum has dropped out. And there's there's certain reasons for that. I, I read another uh, article from another studio head that basically says, with all these like really good TV dramas... Uh, Hollywood apparently is going with the idea you, we have to have Spectrum. The only thing, or uh, Spectre, not Spectre. Again, I can't speak today. Uh, the Spectacular. Uh, they've got to put on these Spectacular show, the big wow stuff. That's the, the Hollywood apparently right now has that feeling that that's the only thing they can sell on because they can't. They feel like they can't really do drama, the character stuff, because they can't compete with 
10 hours worth of Game of Thrones in a season or, you know, 13 hours on the, any of the Netflix Marvel shows or any of the other stuff we really, you know, kind of that adult, really episodic driven uh, series, they feel they can't compete with that. You've got too much space to do character stuff in that time. So that's why they go for the spectacle. That's the word I was looking for, spectacle. Uh, this studio is going the opposite direction. They, they're looking that, hey, people like to see movies. If we shoot for this mid-range stuff, and their their other their goal is to do mid-range, but star-driven, and I use stars in quotation marks. Um, I guess in this case, uh, Charlotte Copley is that star. Uh, but they tend to pick a name. They'll pick a script, and then their ideal is to get a big name or some sort of name behind that. And this is kind of an old formula, but they believe it'll still work. And to, to get this backing, uh, you see with every uh, Shaw Bro- or with every, <laughs> with every every XTX release that's come out, they've had this H Brothers logo, and that's because where they were able to get the money for this is because everyone that's would be semi interested in investing in a Hollywood studio wants the big spectacle films, which are normally built on some sort of independent property, which they obviously don't have. And they're kind of going that you don't need that, so they went to China because you have a lot of Chinese investors who was look who were looking to go and donate, get money, get into some sort of investments. So that's that's how this is all that got set up. They got a ton of money from these Chinese investors. I think he said they had enough to do like 45 films because they were shooting for this mid-level uh, stuff. In some ways, I could almost see STX kind of becoming the new canon, hopefully without collapsing in on itself. But they will do, be, you know, hopefully more competently run because they are bringing in someone that was a Hollywood, you know, they have a, it is being run by a Hollywood producer outside of some crazy Israelis who made like a basically a dirty sex movie. And well, I, I, I will digress. Watch the Electric Boogaloo film or not, whatever. The, was it? It's on Netflix. There's a double documentary that goes in the canon. Uh, but that's how this, and they've only just started releasing films. I believe if it wasn't their first release was in the winter of 2015, like December of 2015. It was then they've only started releasing films this year. So this is one of their earlier releases, and that's why probably when they, I don't know for sure on the backstory here, but I'm guessing when they started passing this around on the internet, the uh, the early demo video, which is basically the. Uh, shootout in the abandoned hotel scene uh, that STX probably saw that decided to throw their money behind it and that's how this came about so you've got a <laughs> you've got a Russian directed film with a South African star being distributed by an American film studio backed by Chinese money Talk about an international production, but that's that's kind of the background of the story. I kind of wanted to get into the STX stuff because it's something I kind of know, and it's it interests me to see kind of these new players because this is how styles of film get in, get produced, and I think this is a good thing actually because hey, look, this is not based on anything. It's based on pure concept. It's an original production. It's an original product. Uh, they didn't base it on anything else. This is not, you know, an adaptation of a video game or a remake or a reboot or anything like that. And they're doing that right. They're not doing these huge gambles on an unknown property like what... I'll pull it in. Oh, uh, like Disney did with Tomorrowland. Where they put... I forget how expensive that film was. 100, 200... You know, they dumped a lot of money into that film. And of course, when it fails, this drops and dies, even though maybe there are some things they could improve on it. If you want to start new franchises up, this is probably the area to go do it. Do some new stuff and put it in the $50 million range. You don't have to do everything as... I mean, don't get me wrong. I love the really super big budget stuff. Sometimes that can get too big. Like the last... The Avengers uh, Age of Ultron had like too much shit packed into it. But I do like, you know, sometimes you can get a lot better you know, stuff out of some of these moderately budgeted films. 
Anyway, that's my, that's my digression onto STX, is because I got now an excuse to kind of talk about that and a little bit probably how that how this got funded because obviously this is one of their earliest releases. They were looking for something that would get them popped in attention. They also released the boy and a couple of others. Uh, their next big one is probably the only the first one that actually fits the formula that they've actually stayed to their investors are going with, which is that Free State of Jones movie that's coming out in a little bit a little bit because that actually is Matthew McConaughey who is legitimately a Hollywood star. Yeah, the rest of their stars have always been like, uh, what was it? The boy had Maggie from The Walking Dead. I don't even, I don't even, I only know her as Maggie. I don't even know the actress's name. Charlotte Coe plays getting a little bit closer. I, I do know his name. He's been in some Hollywood, major Hollywood productions. Still not a major star star is what you'd think. The the Free State of Jones falls way more into what they're aiming for. But then again, hey, they've only had a couple of releases. I think they've only like had six releases so far, so... Now, as for the movie itself, this is where I'm going to start getting into spoilers. I've already talked about some of the batshit insane stuff in this movie, but... When I talked about plot and, like, how it's not there, like, there's some stuff in this film they really don't address. One, the main villain... What was his name? Akon or... Akon or... I've got the IMDb page here. Let's see what... Akon. Akon! Akon! He's a telepath, or, like, he's got telekinetic powers. They do not explain why he has telekinetic powers. He, like, he can just, like, he, fuck it, I don't know, is this supposed to be taking place in the X-Men universe and he's a mutant? I mean, you can draw the conclusion in that he's doing all these, he's apparently he has his corporation, of course, because a guy like this would, of course, be able to handle the financial aspects of raising a massive corporation, because he's a batch insane and wants to dump all his money on super soldier projects. But apparently he's the only tele- telekinetic guy. I don't... Like, they don't explain it. They don't... He just has these powers. I don't know if there's a cut scene. Um, I, I want to... I was going to say it's... Hey, that's bad writing, but... uh. I saw a recent interview with uh, Max Landis, who he's kind of pointed out that normally, hey, don't stop blaming the writers for a lot of this stuff, because normally we write that, and then the directors or the studios cut that stuff out, and then you people blame, apparently he said, like, there's been films where, like, he's he's got the writing credit, but they changed 80% of his script, and he had, like, no say in it, <laughs> and then if there's a complaint, you say, oh, it's bad writing, but I... I, I wrote the proper way. They changed it in editing and with the director. So I don't know. Maybe maybe it's explained at one point. But then again, he this guy is investing in all this weird science. He wants to create an army of cyborg guys. He's investing in some weird stuff. So I could maybe buy. I could kind of buy or kind of come to the. I I could I would definitely buy if they actually outright said it. But I can at least in my mind in my own head canon that. Yeah, at some point he invested in telekinetic power research to, so he could give it to himself. And then he decided, well, I can't take over the world just by myself. I've got to sleep at some point. So I'm going to need to re- create an army of cyborg corpse soldiers. And that's what's going on. Henry is apparently the first successful model and of course, he escapes in their Zeppelin lab. <laughs> the, there, there's the, the opening scene. Apparently, the lab, the, yeah, this lab that you see it in the opening, actually. And at first, I thought there was some sort of like when they had this little escape pod because it is in the trailer that they released that they were either on some like super high like space needle type setup, and that like the uh, the escape pod kind of shot out the top and then dropped down. But no, no, no. Their laboratory is a Zeppelin that's flying above Moscow. <laughs> that's where they're doing their research lab. Why? I don't know. <laughs> because if you're going to do a... If you're going to research how to resurrect people with cyborg parts, you're going to do it on a Zeppelin. Or a blimp. 
And I don't know, do I want to spoil this now? Well, I said I was getting into spoilers, but I was also going to call some shenanigans on this movie because when a con there breaks into the lab and like, ah, I've got to delete you. How do I get rid of you? You work. Ha ha. Like his little evil, I'm going to kill you, you scientist, because you're not doing exactly what I want. One, that didn't seem to make sense. I'm like, well, they, they made your bot. Well, I... I guess he kind of implied it. He killed Henry already. That's actually a lie. That's what I was going with the assumption of. Oh, he killed Henry for some reason for her, and therefore that's why he doesn't want him resurrected. I, that's the assumption I was going with, but they never stated, and I was about to go. That's that's some like some writing issues there, and then of course the. Well, how do you act? How do you just storm your little Zeppelin plane? Like, how do you get up there? How would you attack? You have to fly a helicopter. I don't know if you would want to fly a helicopter onto a blimp. You know, you, that's a pretty tricky landing there. And I didn't see any landing platform. As it turns out, all those concerns are properly addressed because the the wife that we see in there is not Henry's wife. They are actually messing with him because they're trying to figure out a way to motivate sol- these cyborg soldiers they're trying to create to follow instructions. And their plan is to basically do like this Xantos gambit. Is that the correct? I don't know if that's correct. Well, whatever. Is is the the set up this scenario where you wait they people wake up, they've got a memory block or they don't remember who they were really. But she kind of goes, oh, I'm, I'm your wife. You've got to do this. And they maybe put, put like some fake memories of them making love. And then with that, or that's it. So that's their plan is that's, and then they will then do whatever she says. Now, I don't know how this works fine with one Cyborg, or you could have like a small number of these cyborg. Uh, you can make them like cyborg assassins. That would work with that, but they're pl- Well, let me hold on one second. Let me get back into the what the the twist is. So she, yeah, she's not actually that. She's actually a Khan's wife. So this is just something they're pulling on Henry to prove they can figure out how to motivate these guys to follow instructions. As I said, you could see that working with like an individual, or if there's a small number of these guys running around as like some sort of special agent assassins that you want to use to take out. Like that actually probably would have been the better twist instead of having. Instead, they want to raise an army of them, and he's going to march, march on Paris, and then on to uh, the White House with these. I don't know how you're going to do that with nuclear weapons and stuff being a thing because your your army kind of gets then incinerated. I mean, granted, the rest of the world goes down, but that's just how things go. So I, you, you kind of think, wait, if you have an army of people marching like that, don't they eventually figure out, hey, wait a minute, what, we all have the same wife? That's kind of weird. You know, because you're going to have to produce millions of these guys. There's like 7 billion people on this planet. You're going to have to produce hundreds of millions if you want to conquer the world. Like, you you keep four or five of these guys around as like super assassins. Kind of, and just have them pull the gambit of waking up, going, Oh, I'm your wife. Oh, the, the Prime Minister of Italy, he's all behind us. He's trying to kill us. Will you take care of him? Oh, and whatever, your little cyborg guy would go off and kill the Prime Minister of Italy. See, that would work. That If that was their little plan, it was that they were just going to pull this ruse each time. That would work. And hell, they even had the plot element, because I mentioned that Charlotte Coe play his Jimmy characters. You know, as it turns out, he was another scientist working for a con who, like, didn't quite produce a product as... Expected again, they were trying to make another group of super soldiers. He, this guy wasted a lot of money on super soldiers, and he's got like a mercenary army anyway. So 
he uses telekinetic powers to just fuck up Charlotte Coplay and make him a cripple. And now they, and they call him the cripple. <laughs> or the other Jimmys do. But because this guy's such a genius scientist, he developed these, like... Kind of like, they're kind of clone cyborgs themselves, only they're clone cyborgs of him, and he's got some device that, from his wheelchair, he, like, projects his consciousness into them, or he controls them from his device, so he experiences like he's them, but there's, I guess, some sort of personality thing, like, each one is, like, tuned to emphasize some other, some personality trait, so one of them is the scientist, like a super nerd guy you know one is a secret agent you know it gets that persona this is brought out uh one's a hippie one's is a coked out insane man and you know, one's a sniper one's they call him the colonel he's the guy dressed up like he's in a world war ii british <laughs> for no reason no reason he's dressed up like he's a world war ii british guy one guy's dressed up like he's an 80 punk and he's got the 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 craziness. One guy is like he's from a musical, <laughs> and there's a there is a musical number inside a laboratory with the, the with the various Charlotte Coplays in this one. But and that so that's his story. So he starts interfering once he sees he's been trying to plot uh, his revenge against the Khan for a while. He sees Henry as a way to accomplish that, so he tries to uh, help Henry out. So that that's that's all character, and but it, there is a scene where they they pull out. He has a, his character, his homeless character. There's a homeless one. This is the one that gets lit on fire too. Pulls out this chip from his arm. So now I'm thinking, like, you know, you could have done that. That oh, because they because Jimmy pulled out that chip. That was like a deactivation chip that they could use then to shut him down after he's like completed whatever task he's supposed to do. Would have made more sense than, you know, the army. Which they then introduce later on. Apparently, even though Henry has been the prototype, within, like, two days, I, I mean, they kind of say, like, it's implied, kind of, that the film... The film feels like it takes place over one day. But... I think it's supposed to actually take place, like, over three days, or whatever. But when they finally decide to go all out and assault the uh, Akans corporate headquarters and he reveals he has his cyborg army which is all guys in white jumpsuits in which case Henry takes out most of them with his bare hands on a rooftop I forget where I was going with that but it, that, that bloody scene they, he does so that there's that scene. Crap! I really lost track. Of, so I got distracted by a squirrel out my window that I think was about to try to get in. So apologies on that. Goddamn squirrel! They're like he's like stealing this giant leaf, or he thinks he's he can take the leaf. You can go. I, this is weird. Sorry about that. Completely lost track of all that. Um, so where was I? Something about on the roof. Anyway, yeah. So there's a scene he, he's on the roof. The, the Henry takes out all these guys on the roof, and then eventually leads to the reveal of uh, the wife is really a con's wife, and eventually leads to someone having their head decapitated with an eye socket or optical optical cord, whatever you want to call it. Well, they, he, 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 he basically he. This is and by the way, they like Tim Roth is the second build name for this. This is another, I guess, the STX with the advertised the, uh, the big actor. That scene you kind of see him in the trailer is like it. He's in there for like less than a minute. You know, eventually, the co-plays character, the the real Jamie, kind of reveals, "Hey, there was a mini memory blocker. I've now removed it. You're going to start remembering." actual real memories now you can trust them because they kind of reveal that 
the other cyborgs have been given like false memories similar to Jim, uh, similar to Henry's of his wife, only they changed the name for each individual guy. I don't know why then they're following Akan's orders so slavishly, where Jimmy is very independent. It would have made more sense if it was his wife that gave him the order. Give the order to like have like Jimmy killed, or to have Henry killed, instead of a con doing it. But I digress. So that leads to this telekinetic fight, in which eventually Henry's eye gets popped out of its socket. So he wraps... But he eventually gets close enough to this to the Akan character. He wraps the eye socket or the the optical cord around the guy's head, and pulls on it. I guess because it's a cyborg part, he pulls on it so he like cut decapitates him from the uh, upper from the uh, lower jaw or right above the lower jaw up. And because they were flinging around at the obviously telekinetic battle, he's able to get on this helicopter that Khan's wife had gotten on, what we think is the main love interest. And she's like, where is he? Where, where is he? Jimmy, <laughs> Henry just pulls out the decapitated head and like dangles it in front of her. And tries shooting her, and she goes, oh. How could you do this to me? And he writes then, because he does have a voice modulator, so throughout the movie he can't speak, he writes in his own blood, (laughs) E-Z, gets up, and, like, knocks her out of the uh, helicopter. In fact, she's dangling on the edge, and she's like, please, please, Henry, let me up! And he just takes the door to the helicopter and closes it on her hands, and you just hear her drop, and that's how the movie ends. So, technically, you could have a man wakes up from a coma and decides to kill his wife. It's a lovely movie about spousal abuse. Oh, some SJWs wouldn't like that one, but technically accurate. (laughs) And that's it. They had no falling action. Like I said, this really does, does end like a canon film, actually. Shit, STX really is the modern canon. Because that's exactly... The canon films never had any falling action or what you would call narratively falling action. Some sort of, like, scene after the main... You know, something after, like, the kind of just go, yes, it's over now. Nope, it's closed. You hear her, ah! Cut the black credits. That's it. Oh, now I remember. I was talking about... Before I was distracted by the squirrel, I was, re- I was talking about Tim Roth. Yeah, his character shows up yeah, you know, Jimmy, uh, as Henry's getting beat down on this rooftop, his memories start coming back to him. And as he's beaten up there, he gets this memory of what is apparently his father telling him, hey, you know, you know don't be a pussy. You can't just sit there and take, you got to get up and bloody their nose and whatever. And that's what motivates him to, you know, his actual, his true memories are what motivate him to overcome what he previously has not been able to. I guess that's the the film that's the film school version. Oh, he has over his true self has overcome the falsities. <laughs> but yeah, there and throughout this it's like like I said, it's one action scene to another with some very funny scenes in two. They do uh mixed in there. And they do some funny stuff with uh mixing with the soundtrack by kind of like having this action be pausing for something kind of somewhat funny and then picking up the action beat, and it, it works It works when they do that. Uh, they do have Queen in the movie as part of the soundtrack. Uh, the Have Myself a Good Time is playing when he's fighting these, like, 80 guys on this rooftop that he's, like, tearing apart with his bare hands. But it, th- some of this, the, the batshit insane stuff they do in this film... Including, like, you kind of always wonder, I, I, you ever, you always see the scenes like somebody, oh, grabs somebody's balls, and it's like, oh, and you're like, ow. Oh. Well, this goes one step further, because he pops them. He crushes the ball. He crushes his cop's balls in this one scene, and you're just like, everyone in the theater, like, did the same move, where they just did that, ooh, like, moved all their extruments to protect their own <laughs> privates, and it was just, ooh, 
there's like two there's a random samurai hooker that they never really get into like she's there for a couple scenes <laughs> kind of just dies off and there's no real explanation like there's characters in here you kind of want to like know more about like the samurai hooker it, I guess then you that, that maybe that's where some of like the more unusual aspects of it, like, wait, what the, f- why is, I, who's this samurai hooker person? Because she's just kind of there in the background for a couple scenes before she's out of there and just dies. And all these poor, I will like this, at least for, you know, no, people are normally tend to come, you know, normally in, the, in most films, like they, the people on the streets, like, never actually, like, try to intervene and go, oh my god, like, do you need help if they see somebody? I guess the residents of Moscow are rather nice people because at least in this film everyone like kind of goes up to him at first and goes like, "Oh my God, are you okay?" Because you can see from his like his hands like this guy must be covered in blood, and then of course somebody shoots at them and everyone flees away. But there, there's a couple scenes like that. So I I think you got my impression. I, again, I I kind of recommend the film, but at the same time, I could... Oh, there's one other thing I was going to talk about. Well, I'll give my little... You can kind of recommend the film, but at the same time, I, do, I could see how some people would not like the film. It's not very well narratively driven. If you, if you want a narrative, do not come here. You are purely coming to see the violence, the... the the uh, the violence, the over the topness, the batshit stuff, and the novelty of it being all first person. However, that, with that being said, with the novelty stuff, I I didn't think it was as novel as I thought it would be when I was watching it. I think that's because we've had so many uh, found footage films out there, and this does take some, I think. Uh, I think the way they shot this and how they they kind of figured out to shoot stuff definitely took cues from found footage because let's I mean found footage has laid some groundwork on how do you structure and film this type of stuff and I guess technically you could argue this is found footage because part of it they get revealed that what we're seeing from Henry's eyes and everything has been actually transmitting to a con the whole time uh, so you could gather data so you could so you could see that uh, Henry would actually be properly motivated by this wife ruse and I mentioned this in an earlier podcast but this is not the first film to be shot entirely in the first person perspective Um, when I was in college I think it was actually undergrad actually yes it was undergrad I had this one it was video game narrative studies that I took because everyone needs the BS class only I could I could do an entire podcast on the insanity of this because we had a professor who definitely was one of those like professors who like was all into the concept but not actual committing and figuring out like doing like never he, he was like a, I think it was like a visual arts professor really uh, not so much an English professor which I figured was going to be doing the class because believe me, I, I gave you the name, and you probably sound sounds cool. The guy was very much one of those like. Actually, he is now apparently. This was apparently his last semester at the school I was at, and then he he was transferring, or he'd been a he had gotten a position at Berkeley, so that might have also explained why this kind of like everything felt like really uncommitted in this class. It was a weird class, but as I can say, the guy went to go teach at Berkeley. So yeah, a little woo. Little he was a it was an odd class, but I, but one of the things he did do is because there were so many films or video games that were in the first person, was he had found this old 1940s film. That was a detective movie that was shot entirely in the first person. Uh, and I could see why you would do that from a, you know, a detective, so you're seeing it through literally through the detective eyes, so you can go with you can, you know see what the detective truly sees and kind of fig- see if you can figure out along with the detective what's going on. So there technically is one film that was shot 
this is, I guess, technically the second film that was all first person, but, you know, 70 years? I'll give it credit. And I've gone on for 45 minutes, so there's my opinions. Please like, subscribe, share, if you will. Uh, coming up next, what is the next film coming out? I know we've got Civil War coming up. I I think oh there's that Winter's War movie coming uh the the Snow White sequel that drops Snow White completely and everyone is actually happy about that so the the Huntsman sequel yeah it's I guess truly really, it's it's the Huntsman's movie so that'll probably be the next one I see uh, hopefully the theater will have an earlier showing so I will be able to do the recording I didn't get into late. After seeing this, they did like a 9 o'clock showing, which is hard enough, because it was I know it's a Thursday night showing, which meant I still had to work today on Friday, and I no longer live 10 minutes from the theater, I now live a good 30 minutes from the theater, so not fun getting back. So hopefully they'll do like a... If they do the early showings, it'll be like a 7 o'clock one like they usually do. I don't know why they push this one back to 9. I digress, though. That's all for now, folks. Signing out.